Greetings, everyone. My name is Resh Ramasamy. I am a university lecturer, a PhD student, a published author, and a developmental educator. Vlog 12 is devoted towards unpacking the narratives pertaining to disenfranchised grief. And yes, I am shooting this vlog outside in my gorgeous garden and it's freezing cold. But let's do this. Let me begin by asking you a question. What exactly is disenfranchised grief? Or have you heard that term or concept before? Have you supported someone who experienced disenfranchised grief or perhaps have you experienced disenfranchised grief yourself or are you continuing to experience disenfranchised grief? Allow me to walk you on a journey of understanding, exploration and illumination where I will share my perspective on disenfranchised grief. Having suffered internalized ableism, internalized homophobia, internalized racism, and mental health issues that are continuing. It took me some time to understand what the problem was. And because my experiences were so standalone and removed from the normative experiences of grief, there were times I questioned myself. There were times I wondered if I was going insane. And there were times I wondered if I should be placed in a mental asylum because I could not articulate or contextualize or interpret and externalize that suffering until I read this article by Kenneth Doker, the founder of Disenfranchised Grief. Professor Doker defined disenfranchised grief as follows. He asserted that disenfranchised grief is a type of grief that incurs a loss or losses that are not socially acknowledged and socially supported therefore it renders the person who's grieving to not disclose or externalize the emotions the tribulations and the suffering associated with the grief itself and the implications that follow with the person who's experiencing disenfranchised grief is profoundly debilitating agonizing and it's damaging at a functional psychosocial level because when I was going through all that grief with my internalized ableism, homophobia and racism, there were times I just saw darkness and that's why I'm outside in darkness. There were times I was not able to express my needs. I was experiencing cognitive dissonance where I was not able to articulate or assert or voice my concerns because I was numb. I was so mentally exhausted because people were not acknowledging my pain. People were taking me for granted. It is suffice to say that disenfranchised grief has an individual journey, an individual enactment to it. By that, what I mean is that People experience disenfranchised grief based on their individual experiences. And most of the time, we find people who are experiencing this type of grief are not normative. They are standalone on the outer. Their experiences are not parallel or comparable with the majority populace. The grief is so unique, it's so complex, it's so intricate, and it's very intersectional as well, and overlapping in nature, that it removes the person very quickly 
from the normative type of grief. Therefore, it's imperative for the support person, professional, paid or unpaid support person to understand the person's grief from their vantage point. There are different elements or core ingredients, I call it, that separate disenfranchised grief from the normative types of grief. And these are as follows. Firstly, the person experiencing the grief itself and its associated losses are complex, intricate, and standalone in nature. Now, whilst we can draw parallels and establish some similarities from disenfranchised grief to normative types of grief, however, the complexity and the severity of the grief itself makes it become very, very standalone, very, very different, and there is a clear and distinct polarization between both types of grief. Secondly, it's time variable. As I mentioned to you all earlier, disenfranchised grief is complex and very intricate in nature, and it's non-normative, it's atypical in nature as well. And therefore, the person who's experiencing this type of grief might sometimes, or most of the time, require more time to mourn, more time to come to terms with the losses, to come to acknowledge what's happened. And what makes all this very difficult is because the person is not warranted the opportunity or given the opportunity to talk about this openly, to talk about their losses with no judgment. And thirdly, emotions. The manifestations and the enactments of disenfranchised grief itself. And there is good, bad and ugly sides to it. And if we want to contextualize this further in a psychological perspective, we can look at the fight, flight and freeze response, okay? Now, for some people, when they are traumatized or there is a perceived threat, they start to fight back. For some people, you might run away and hide and withdraw yourselves even further. And for others, you might just freeze and become somewhat speechless or in a daze. Now, if we just take ourselves back to a few weeks ago in the US with the passing and killing of George Floyd by police officers. Now, I'm not supporting criminals. I condone violence. However, there is a reason why some colored people are behaving or have behaved barbarically or have enacted that reptilian brain and not engaging in that neurocortex element of the brain. And unfortunately, when you enact or activate the reptilian brain, objective reasoning goes away completely. Emotions take over and emotions take over and emotions can sometimes bring out the bad in people. It can activate and enliven the devil in you. Hence why we saw some of those protesters behaving in a barbaric fashion because the trauma is so profound yet subdued and a trigger sets them off. So the killing of George Floyd has set people off because their grief is disenfranchised. And I've experienced racism myself. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that Australia is very, very accepting. Yes, it is accepting but there's work to do. There is still lots of work to do within organizations. What I'm seeing more of is that selective and subtle shades of racism that can go undetected. It's invisible in its um, format and presentation, 
but it's still racism. Racism is racism. It has different enactments, simple as that. Now, for some people, that trauma being objectified, being subject to constant injustices within their micro, meso, chrono, exo life across the lifespan can trigger a response in them that is seen as unfavorable and not fitting within humanity. We need to acknowledge that disenfranchised grief has its dark side where it is detrimental to the person themselves and the person can engage in destructive behaviors to themselves such as self-harming like what I used to do when I was younger or they can enact that destruction within themselves by externalizing it killing people terrorism fighting back because the trauma is so very profound. One of the fairly recent experiences of disenfranchised grief was when I got accused and alleged of being a pedophile. Hence why the NDI system is flawed. Clients can do no wrong, but service providers can do all wrong. Please work that out and when you do, come and see me. Anyway, I was doing a fantastic job with my clients. I live for my clients. That's my motto, I live for them. But I was placed in a compromised position when my boss was trying to force me to over-service the client who needs behavior support. And I said, no, there's no need to see the client eight hours per week or 10 hours per week. It is over servicing the client. What's important is um, the attention span and in short burst, two hours maximum per week is a great allocation. Anyway, as I'm very, very confrontational, I confronted my boss, challenged my boss. And as a result of all of that, I had to voluntarily resign from the company and a week later, I received this complaint, a formal complaint that was raised against my name, accusing me of being a pedophile because I was supporting the client with her bisexuality identity. There wasn't many professionals out there to date that understands homosexual identity development. And this is the very reason why I've devoted my time and energy in this area. And yet, I get shafted, yes. So long story cut short, all that investigation and probing for information with my barrister's support who I just adore, I was left feeling completely broken, depleted of energy. I lost my sense of purpose. Now, and you know something? The biggest fear I had at that time, not anymore, was to externalize this experience and talk to people about it. As soon as you're a male service provider, you're a target. You are deemed as vulnerable because pedophilia, cases of pedophilia are typically associated and attached with male workers. Now, I was afraid to talk about this experience with people. My close friends knew it. I had informed my clients um, that I was seeing privately and they were happy with me. They trusted me wholeheartedly. However, the amount of anxiety that came from the investigation and all these allegations rendered me incapable and non-functional. There were times where I could not even get out of bed. There were times when I was completely lifeless. I wanted to end my life because the grief was so profound and I was petrified that I've worked so hard to be where I'm at at the moment and continue to do so and there are idiots and barbaric human beings out there 
within this NDIS system, a caring and sensitive system who are damaging people's lives clients and service providers as well. The investigation went through its process and time and the outcome was obviously favourable. I had nothing to worry about. From the time I received that letter, I knew I was innocent. Yet I had to prove my innocence by waiting for a response that seemed forever to return to me. But life goes on. I had to still find other work or I had to still see my existing clients. I had to still study. At that time, I was working on my master's thesis. As a high achiever, I always aim for high distinction grades, but the timing was not favorable for me. With the allegation, the investigation, and having that thought, I might lose my DCSI clearance and having to fulfill my educational needs, having to work with my clients to make some income. I can go on and on and on. I have shared this story in educational platforms, uh, in conferences, because I want this story to be known. I want my voice to be heard because there could be other people, innocent lives being damaged every single day that go unreported, unnoticed. So how do we support a person who's experiencing disenfranchised grief? Well, let me begin by reiterating there are no shortcuts. If you are a textbook professional or you want to take shortcuts and the easy way out, I suggest you remove yourself voluntarily from your client or the person you're supporting. Do not cause further trauma. It's very simple. In the very first instance, go and learn about this concept. It's not that hard. There is ample of professional development out there. Go and immerse yourself in education learn about this concept and its enactment and how people experience disenfranchised grief on a daily basis. There are lots of experts, supposedly experts, that purport themselves to know every single thing. I challenge you, if you really know everything, I challenge you that if you think you're an expert, when the word expert is being articulated, I question your intelligence. If they have a wide ranging intellect, because no one's an expert here. I am an expert of my own life and so are you. We are there to help people by providing a helping hand. We might be a specialist in an area or areas but not experts. So when supporting a person who's experiencing disenfranchised grief, stop that judgment and stop pretending you know it all. Ask questions, engage in reflective practice, engage in collaboration, engage in narratives, talk, share your stories. And in fact, I found personally with my own experiences uh, as a developmental educator supporting gay clients, I talk about my internalized homophobia and internalized ableism to my autistic and gay clients. And they thank me for that by self identifying that I also have experienced or is experiencing that type of grief. People feel a lot more safer to disclose their pain and suffering. I wrote this very, very issue in my recent publication, which is a book chapter, that clients themselves, LGBT clients, preferred for professionals that were supporting them to be gay and to self-identify as gay to them because by establishing commonalities and parallels, 
the grief itself becomes somewhat normative. So we want to normalize the experiences. As I mentioned to you earlier on, the grief itself is so standalone and atypical. By normalizing a person's experiences, we might give them a lot more better coping mechanisms to come to terms and to accept the grief itself and the associated losses. We have some surprises in this vlog. I'm very privileged to introduce two very special people, remarkable human beings and professionals who will share with you their perspectives on disenfranchised grief. Um, my name is Alexander Jason Dyson. I'm a recent Flinders University graduate of a double degree in psychology, science and business marketing. Um, I've just recently been accepted to a postgraduate program at Monash University and at the same time I run my own mentoring company uh, through the NDIS here in South Australia. Um, with the disenfranchised grief in the social and healthcare system, uh, I believe more does need to be done. Um, I think people are starting to have a bit more of a profound understanding on the things that are occurring um, and what disenfranchised grief actually is and how it can affect special populations. But in terms of the theoretical, um, we also need that lived experience and that's only gonna, that's only gonna come um, from, from actually asking the questions and having those people with those lived experiences explain what that actually is. So um, I myself, I um, have a clinical diagnosis of uh, ADHD autism as a child and also as an adult. I, I'm actually a high school dropout, so I left high school in year nine um, and I went and got a trade because I wasn't able to do what my um, peers could do. Um, I wasn't able to you know, work in a classroom socially accepted as the norm, um, you know, I always prefer to be outside. Um, I have a lot of difficulty sitting still. Uh, even right now, I'm moving, <laughs> uh, as you can see. Um, but in in terms of those those delays, um, they made me feel quite different because when you can see other people and what's happening and and how they're doing things, you start to wonder and you go, "Oh, hang on a minute, why can't why can't I do that?" Um, you know, and then you start to feel isolated. You start to lose self worth. Um, and it's taken me a very long time to understand my psych um, in order to actually be able to answer some of those questions that, you know, it's not an issue of being different. It's not an issue of being behind. It's not an issue of no, it's just a matter of when and when it is my time. And through relentless practice and communication, I'm able to actually work on a lot of those things that I consider to be, you know, a delay. Um, but they also allow me to um, become a better person at the same time. The things that have affected me quite severely is things that a lot of people may not come up against, such as, um, you know, feeling indif indifferent, um, being treated indifferently based on, um, I guess, my appearance, the things that I choose to wear, uh, how I talk, how I act, um, and some other things such as my developmental delays, which have occurred as a result of my ADHD. So I couldn't tie my shoes until I was about 16. I couldn't tell time until I was about 18. Um, I didn't even start dating until I was around 20, 21. Um, and more recently, I've just started to learn how to cook. So, um, but I finished a double degree. So, you know, it, it's kind of really interesting that um, you, you might ask why I think that's dis disenfranchised grief, because internally to me, those things have really affected um, my well-being, you know. Um, other people can do all those things well and truly before the ages that I was able to do them. Um, and there's a whole, whole another side of it as well. But yeah, it's, it, gets pretty, it gets pretty crazy in there. When, when you're thinking about what disenfranchised grief is, um, we don't want to take away, I don't want to take away from anybody else's experience because, you know, you look at one individual with autism or ADHD and what they may experience as disenfranchised grief, and that's just one individual. Um, it's not something that you can apply to an entire population of people. It, it's definitely case by case basis. I think in policy and practice, um, I, I would love to see that um, within the next 20 years, it's mandatory that chairs, organizations, companies have a policy that actually prevents um, the discrimination of having someone on the chair or board at a top level management with a disability. I believe the only way through is to really understand through lived experience and acknowledging those people with disabilities. Um, you know, and the only way we're gonna do that is if we give them an opportunity. Um, too many times have people been asked, but then the information's never executed or actioned. So what this actually would mean is that in organizations at a top level management, we have someone with a disability, someone with lived experience, and, and not just one person, we're gonna need a few, we're gonna need a lot um, in order to actually address the real issues that are occurring and help build those bridges to those gaps. Um, I'd love to see myself, um, and I hope to do this as well, I'd love to 
not just revolutionise but also evolutionise um, the industry as a whole and, and how the world actually sees people with disability. Uh, you know, some of the, the top thinkers in the world have disabilities. Richard Branson, um, you know, Sigmund Freud was supposedly supposed to have had ADHD. Um, you know, Albert Einstein, these, these people all supposedly had um, you know, understimulated minds or, or some sort of disability that, that, you know, wasn't necessarily addressed back then and there, but through time and science we've come to realise that a lot of the issues that have been solved have been solved by people with disabilities. And that doesn't take anything away from the normal population. No, not at all. They're, uh, you know, brilliant experts in the normal population, but it means that we should not um, disclude or exclude um, people with disabilities because they obviously have an ability um, that is very different to that of someone with, um, you know, a normal functioning mind. And I hate the word normal because I think, I think you know, I don't think anyone is normal. I think, I think we're all a bit weird and wacky in our own way, but I think what's really important is that when we, we treat every individual with respect and we acknowledge the differences in each person because no two people operate the same. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Ferrotta. Um, I am an early intervention practitioner and alcohol and other drug specialist. I work with young people between the ages of 8 to 18, uh, specialising in uh, areas of complex trauma, which include uh, childhood neglect, domestic violence, um, uh, child abuse, both physical and sexual, and young people uh, with alcohol and other drug challenges and issues. So if we look at disenfranchised grief with the inability to um, deal with grief um, in, its, in its present state, and if we then uh, look at disenfranchised grief as an inability to close off that grief. So as an example, um, you um, break from a partner and one partner's left with this grief that they're not able to understand because there's no closure with regards to the relationship, okay? So if we look at a young person not able to deal with or provide closure to the incidents that took place during that time or make sense um, of their uh, experiences at that age, okay, we can look at that as disenfranchised grief. So from a theoretical understanding, um, Theoretic, um, disenfranchised grief can be seen as trauma, and trauma of a complex nature. Complex trauma is quite often trauma that happens at a young age, okay? Uh, usually single digit ages, so starting from around about five or six, okay? And I stated before that um, complex trauma, uh, like um, you know, negative childhood experiences, includes things like um, uh, domestic witness of domestic violence, um, physical and sexual abuse, uh, childhood neglect, um, things like um, poor attachment with a parent, okay? uh, parents um, behaving in uh, over -authorita um, authoritarian ways. Uh, can also be things like severe bullying at school. Okay? So if we look at um, complex trauma, okay, aligning with disenfranchised grief from a young person, okay. And then complex trauma then becomes a young person's ability to cope with those um, events. And they can be single events or ongoing. Quite often they're ongoing though, especially for young people. And then complex trauma manifests its way into um, adverse coping experiences, okay, or coping mechanisms. So as an example, by experiencing these uh, types of trauma, okay, at a young age, we might take on coping mechanisms that could present as disassociating from the present, okay? So all of a sudden, as a coping mechanism, I remove myself mindfully from the present state where I'm being assaulted or being uh, physically abused or neglected and I remove myself cognitively from the present. Okay, once that abuse or that traumatic experience is over, I'm able to return. But I, I've disassociated myself from that event. Okay, now that's a coping mechanism and that may work appropriately 
for someone who was 8, 9, 10, 11 or 12. Now let's fast forward that 12, 13 years, I'm now an adult. I'm trying to engage in relationships, be they um, employment relationships, business relationships, intermittent and friendship relationships. And the moment I deal with anything that heightens my anxiety, I disassociate. I lose focus. I tend to become heightened, heightened from an anxiety perspective. Okay, I, I might um, I might escape physically. I might uh, appear to be disinterested in what's actually happening. However, there's this fear-based response that. Um, on another perspective, there's this fear-based response that this person that I'm supposed to love or trust puts me in a state of mental fleeing because my guardians, who I'm supposed to trust implicitly when I'm a young age, inflicted abuse, neglect, sexual abuse and physical abuse. And as a result of trusting that person implicitly, I have to deal with all this trauma. If we look at the issue, or if we ask the very simple question about any type of behavior that we are trying to change. So if we look at it individually, if I am presenting with, so like uh, negative types as a, um, uh, a turn of phrase, okay, or behaviors that I'm trying to change, what's the first thing that I need to acknowledge as an individual? And that is, I have a problem. I have an issue that I'm, trying, that I'm facing. I have a challenge that I'm trying to face. So that's the first thing that we have to do from a positive policy uh, perspective and a societal perspective, that there is such a thing called complex trauma. Okay, that's the first thing we have to acknowledge. And as such, that will then guide how, what type of um, therapeutic modalities we use. Because we can't use modalities that have the perception that everything has been okay through childhood okay, and adolescence, because it's not. So I can't use modalities okay, that have um, an expectation okay, that is something that is a strength-based perspective to work on prior to an incident occurring. Okay, can't do that. Good example of that, dare I say, is cognitive behavior therapy. It works great if I can provide an individual with um, an issue okay, that may arise from a type of behavior, okay? I can't do that with a person who's dealt with complex trauma, okay? Because there's no alternate behavior that they've been used to. They've used the one type of behavior their whole life, and that served them well up until a point, okay? CBT, so for example, CBT on cognitive behavior therapy with post-traumatic stress disorder, I can say, look, you've got a previous life that was great, You've got some great behaviours that we can draw on. Okay, I can't do that with complex trauma. So I need to find a different modality, alternative modality, therapeutic modalities that will help change the behaviours that are triggered through complex trauma. So the best thing we can do is number one, provide a safe space for the individual, a safe base. Okay, and um, provide appropriate attention. So as therapists, be ever present, which is something that they never got, okay? Number one, um, so from a policy perspective, we need to acknowledge that there's a problem, that there's a percentage of the population that has dealt with complex trauma and is dealing with complex trauma, okay? Which is why we have a Department for Child Protection, okay? Number one. Um, from a therapeutic perspective, uh, as I stated before, be present with your client. Really be present, okay? Provide a safe base, okay? Um, from, a, from a case study perspective, I've worked with some clients now for four or five years, and it's only now that I am developing a level of trust, okay? Because the client's experience is the people that they trust the most have let them down. So there's a barrier there that I have needed to get past. Okay, so providing that safe base and providing no expectation on my client. So as a client, you come to me, I have no expectation of you to do a certain thing. 
or to make certain gains, okay, or to follow a particular pathway that I might be laying out for you. What I want to do is I want you to provide the ability of creating your own path. Okay, uh, and the last thing, one of the other things that you do by doing that, you give the client control in a therapeutic session, okay, in a therapeutic context. So in all therapeutic engagements, there's always power imbalance, okay? Regardless of whether the client is four or 40, they come into a therapeutic space, the therapist is the one with all the knowledge, okay, and the client is the one that's coming for help. That immediately puts the client in the position of vulnerability, okay? Anybody that asks for help is in a position of vulnerability, okay? Regardless of what the situation is. So one of the great, or one of the things, uh, or the um, methods that I try and use with my clients or um, tactics that I use is provide the client a sense of control and decision-making power, okay? So I allow them to direct the therapeutic session to a certain degree, okay? And the way that I create a pathway or a direction is to drop hints and drop subtleties and drop um, perspectives and counter arguments, okay? You plant seeds, okay? And you don't challenge your client until you've developed a really strong sense of trust, okay, with the client. Um, and you can, you can quantify that from the client's perspective through certain um, key points along the way, certain things that they'll say, certain things that they'll do, you know. So for example, is a client who comes to you very vulnerable able to hold your gaze for a long period of time and be comfortable in that space? Is a client able to say something like, I trust you now, so I want to tell you this, you know, where they did it six months ago, okay? Is a client able to sit with you in silence? You know, is a client able to do that and not fidget? Okay, so there are, there are certain markers, behavioral markers and vocal markers and checkpoints that you can draw from to understand that there's been a particular level of trust that's been established in the therapeutic relationship that will let you understand that you've reached a certain point that you can then try certain things. But until that point where we're um, nudging very softly, we're planting seeds, um, we're providing alternative perspectives, we're not outright challenging the client from the get-go, okay? We're providing a safe space for the client to step into and then we can explore those traumatic events once we've developed a, you know, a, um, a level of trust. And the good thing is it's not, it's not all the same. It's not, you know, we're lucky enough that we work with clients that are extremely individual, their experiences and their personalities and their behaviours. So every timeline is going to be different. You know, obviously what might take you two months, may take someone else two years. A lot of time for, for Resh. Um, I've been lucky enough to know Resh from a uh, personal perspective. Um, I hope that one day I get to know Resh from a professional perspective, whether it's through um, you know, uh, therapy-driven uh, association or uh, academic-driven association. Um, hopefully one day I'll get to work with Resh, but I find Resh to be a, you know, an amazing individual. He's very passionate about what he does. So I wanna say thank you very much for having me um, on today. And I hope that um, some people out there have got something that they can use. Well, that concludes the vlog for today. I hope you've learned something from it. If you are suffering or experiencing disenfranchised grief, I invite you to contact me on YouTube or on my email, which is resh.ramasami at gmail.com. I'm here to support you with unconditional positive regard. Onwards and upwards. Love you all, Resh.